One of my goals is to gradually transform our garden to a more self-sustaining food forest that produces more and more food every year with less and less time, effort, and expense. Planting more edible perennials brings us closer to this goal every year. And so does growing self-seeding annuals and biennials that produce volunteer crops year after year without us having to buy seeds or plant them. Today I'll show you 15 volunteer crops that are currently growing in our garden. Some of these crops were planted more than a decade ago and have produced volunteer crops ever since without having to be replanted. Let's start here in the hoop house where we're growing more volunteer crops than anywhere else in the garden. After overwintering here, many of these plants are now going to seed. We'll let most of the seeds fall in place to produce the next crop. All I do to manage these crops is to select the plants that I want to reseed, which is most of them, and the rest of them I harvest or chop and drop before their seeds are viable. This gives me some control over the population of different plants, and it also prevents any single crop from taking over. Finally, after the plants drop their seeds, I chop and drop them to provide organic matter and nutrients to nourish the next crop of volunteers. I also typically make an annual application of compost or vermicompost and use fast decomposing mulches like comfrey and grass clippings. Before showing you the 15 volunteer crops that we're currently growing, I wanted to make two points about this approach. First, we don't worry about cross-pollination because the crops that we allow to reseed either don't cross-pollinate with anything else in the garden, or they might, but we're happy with the crosses. Second, crop rotation isn't an issue because all of our volunteers grow in diverse polycultures of unrelated crops. Crop rotation is designed to resolve pest, disease, and nutrient issues that are associated with monocultures, but they're far less common in polycultures. And we've used this approach for many years without seeing any of the problems that crop rotation is designed to remedy. Now let's take a look at the 15 volunteer crops we're currently growing, and I'll start back here with mustard greens. Like most of our volunteers, mustards are a cut and come again leafy green, which means we can come back again and again to harvest individual leaves, but they'll still grow to maturity, produce seeds, and then reseed. In fact, these are so prolific at reseeding that we have to chop and drop a lot of them before they go to seed, or we'll have too many mustard green plants. Now let's take a look at another mustard green, our giant red mustards. These are a great example of how even though these can cross-pollinate with the mustards I just showed you, and we planted them over a decade ago, we still get what looks like giant red mustards year after year. Right next to the giant red mustard, we have this plant, which appears to be a cross between the giant red and the first mustard green I showed you. It's a great example of how even though mustard greens can cross, we don't really care because we like the crosses as much as the originals, and pollinators like them too. One final note about mustard greens is that they have a very strong mustard flavor, and you should definitely try them before growing them. Though we love them, a lot of people find the taste too strong. Now let's look at some Swiss chard that's going to seed. Swiss chard produces a lot of seeds and self sows very well. It can cross with other Swiss chard varieties, but we don't really care about that. It can also cross with beets, but we don't have any beets flowering at the same time as the Swiss chard, so that's not an issue. Below the Swiss chard, we have some kale and collards that overwintered in a cold frame. These plants don't self sow as readily as many of the other volunteers that we grow, but they will produce volunteers and they produce some interesting crosses. Different varieties of kale can cross pollinate and the same is true for collards. Kale and collards can also cross pollinate. However, we always enjoy the crosses, so it's not really an issue for us. Also, these plants can cross pollinate with broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, and kohlrabi, but none of those plants are flowering at the same time, so that's not an issue. Before leaving the hoop house, I wanted to show you one more volunteer crop, tatsoi, but unfortunately I'm having a hard time finding it here in this jungle, but it's in here somewhere, and it's a fairly reliable volunteer crop. Now let's see what volunteers are growing outside the hoop house. Our next volunteer crop is a very cold hardy green that easily overwinters here in zone five under cover. It's a very prolific self sower, and it doesn't cross pollinate with other crops. Now that the weather is warm, our Claytonia is going to seed, and we're harvesting it by the bucket to keep it from reproducing too much. We're enjoying it in soups and in Palak paneer. If you look closely down here, you'll see tiny black Claytonia seeds that have dropped onto the edge of the raised bed. Right next to the Claytonia, we have volunteer mosh, which like everything else I've shown you so far is a cool weather green that's now going to seed with the warm weather. 
Mosh is extremely cold hardy. In fact, this mosh survived the entire winter here in Zone 5 without any protection at all and produced a delicious crop of small rosette leaves in the spring. If you look down here, you can see some of the seeds that have fallen onto the edge of the raised bed. Different mosh varieties will cross with each other, but they won't cross with other plants in the garden. We'll see our next crop of mosh emerge next winter for late winter and early spring harvest. Our next two crops are parsley and arugula, which we planted many years ago, but have enjoyed as volunteers ever since. Here we have volunteer parsley that came up last fall, survived the winter under cover, and is now bolting and will soon go to seed to produce another volunteer crop. Here in front of the parsley, we have arugula or rocket. We love the leaves and salads and the seeds taste really good too. This plant doesn't cross with anything else in the garden and it will drop seeds soon to produce a crop next spring. In the next bed, we have volunteer dill and mizuna. Dill is an excellent self sower. It will cross with other dill varieties, but won't cross with any other herbs or vegetables. In front of the dill, we have some mizuna, which is a cut and come again green with a strong mustard flavor. I just harvested all the leaves, so we're not seeing it in its full glory here. The next three volunteers all love the heat of summer. The first is burgundy amaranth. My wife's mother gave us seeds years ago, and we've enjoyed them as volunteers ever since. Now let's go out front to see two more heat-loving volunteers. In the front yard garden, we grow both ornamentals and edibles. We have eggplants and tomatillos in grow bags, and two fire ring raised beds. In this one, along with the onions, we have volunteer purslane, which is a very nutritious succulent green that is an excellent plant source for omega-3 fatty acids. And finally, there's red auric, which is a good spinach substitute during the heat of summer. We planted it only once many years ago, and it comes back year after year as a volunteer. We just have to let it go to seed. I hope you enjoyed this look at the volunteer crops we're currently growing in our garden. These crops come back year after year and provide harvest without us having to buy seeds or plant anything. Along with edible perennials, volunteer crops bring us closer to our goal of a self-sustaining food forest that produces more and more food every year with less and less time, effort, and expense. Of course, the crops that will do well as volunteers in your garden will vary depending on where you live. For example, if you live in the subtropics, tomatoes might be a great volunteer crop. If you grow volunteers where you live, please let me know in a comment below. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please subscribe for more videos on how to grow a lot of food on a little land without spending much or working harder than you have to.